whites to come in and sign up for five dollars and get these lands. So you had thousands of miles of land that was open after systematic wars, smallpox blankets, uh, deception through uh, indentured servitude. People thought they were working out deals to work for X amount of years with the person. You see, most people aren't familiar with indentured servitude. Real fast, indentured servitude is uh, an old way of doing business. When uh, other systems such as Egypt had this uh, way of doing business, a man, I could come to this man here and this man could own land, he can own crops, he can own uh, a series of things, and I'm poor, and I need some wealth, I need some land, I need to establish myself. So what would happen is, he would offer me a position to toil his land, to take care of his cattle, to do X, Y, and Z, and the bargaining deal would be, I can have a little house on this small piece of land. I can eat X amount of these crops. I can plant my own crops on a small piece of his acres, see? And this is what the deal would be, sometimes five, six, seven years, depending on whatever deal was made. But what happened was, because this was such a familiar system, when the Europeans came here to the Aborigines, the Aborigines were already practicing this. And they came here and they used their innocence, they used their own system against them. They said, okay, well, work for me, and in seven years I'll let you go. But in the contract, it would state, um, Things that would get your, your, your lease extended. Things that would get your servitude extended, okay? So for example, if I'm toiling his land and I show up late for five days in a row and some of his crops died because I didn't water them on time or some of his cows are getting losing weight because I'm not feeding them properly, he can say, look man, you're doing a poor job. I'm gonna extend your servitude for six months outside of the contract agreed upon. That's his right, and that's what I'm bound to. So what they did to the Aborigines, they would keep finding small infractions and keep tricking them into extending their time. So he would do something real small, and they would say, oh, that's two more years, oh, that's three more years, and next thing you know, that man went from seven year contract to 77 years. And then that's when the whips and chains came, okay? It didn't start off with, it didn't start off with whips and chains. They didn't just come in, shoot muskets, whipping and chaining them, Poor black man, he's scared, can't fight back. That's not how it happened. A lot of deception took place. It wasn't just man-to-man -man combat. So, um, <clears throat> this is major because this establishes, once again, uh, who they're not and who you are. Because the gist of this all, before we come to the end here, is right here. This is the speed bump before we come to the last section. The NAAIP. Okay, this man here, unfortunately I forgot his name, but I have his YouTube channel that I'm gonna reference at the end when I get my references. He is pretty much the forerunner for the NAAIP, and this is a membership application, 2017, and anybody who is so-called black in America can apply for this membership and be recognized politically as an Aborigine of America, and, you, and these people have taken this to the UN, these people have gone to the high courts. It's already established. This is not some hypothesis theory. This isn't a pipe dream. This is already in the works. People have already done this. This information is not new. This information is old, very old. It's new to the people who remain on mainstream information. So anything that you haven't been told by schools or television is gonna seem new. But this is old information here. So the end game in everything that we've just presented is that the African, the so-called African American is the only one with the identity crisis. Everybody else has one identity throughout the history of the world. Only the so-called black man, the so-called African American, his identity gets changed every other century. He goes from Negro to black, to boy, to coon, to African American, and what's next, okay? so. We're the only ones who switch our names. Whites remain whites, Mexicans stay Mexicans, Asians stay Asian, a Chinaman stays an Arab stays an Arab. You don't have 50 different names for Arabs, okay? So what's been happening to us as black people is nothing uh, less than what we know as misnomers, okay? It's like they do in the media when they wanna name certain political enemies. They have about 16 different names over the last 10 years they've given them because it takes away from the humanity 
it takes away from the people truly knowing who they are and the onlookers truly knowing who the enemy is. So the black man here has to identify with his true identity and his true identity might be some ancestors from Africa because like I said, 100,000 were brought here. But once we understand the math behind genealogy, I don't care if your 55th grandfather was, was from the Congo. By now, that gene's out of you. You don't have that gene. You, that, that, you can't claim that. You have to claim something that's prominent in your gene pool. And what's gonna be prominent in your gene pool is what the prominent type of people were that designed your gene pool. You can't have one relative that's Nova Scotian, okay, four centuries ago and claim that I'm, I'm a Nova Scotian. It doesn't work like that. So the African-American needs to know this is his land. He's not from Africa. He's from here. The whole purpose of the roots being told to you, the whole purpose of you being shipped to West Africa, the whole purpose of you having the misnomer of so many different titles, Negro, Black, African-American, is to keep your head spinning because the biggest well-kept secret is this is the land of the black man. The black man is from America, not Africa. So here, in conclusion, we're going to run across a man named Hank Greeley. He is a law professor at Stanford University. He went on 60 Minutes, did an extended, thorough interview on the hoax of the DNA ancestry scams that's been taking place. We see now it's real popular to get your DNA tested. It's real popular to find out who your family tree is and your fifth cousin, your fourth cousin. And the funny thing is, I've heard this more than one time, people who know that they have quote unquote Cherokee, Creek, et cetera, et cetera, Indian in their family, when they take this ancestry, to, uh, when they go to ancestry or take the DNA test, none of that comes up. They keep telling you, oh, you're from, your ancestors are from Europe. Oh, your ancestors are from France. They're telling you anything but Native American. Now, before I continue, keep in mind, there were over thousands of tribes from, Native, from the Americas. Five civilized tribes is a flick in the bucket of water of how many tribes were in America. We can't even identify with most of the tribes that were here because it requires bloodline. It requires a blood test to go into the government system to have on record for you to even be matched with. So a lot of tribes can never be found as far as we go because they're out of the records. They're literally people that were extinct. So in the world of information and books, uh, in the world of documentation, I should say, all the things that were just presented right now happened yesterday. People have been writing things down in books for years. So this is not something, it's I'm saying 1800s, 1600s, it's pretty much happened yesterday, what we're talking about here. People have been documenting things forever. So in conclusion, we're gonna go over this small part of the DNA test uh, with this man's interview here, okay? So it says, I quote him now, Hank Greeley says, people wanna believe in the DNA results, but it's not fair for us to let them believe that we are giving them certain answers because scientifically, we just can't. Okay, now it goes on to say, uh, this business of genealogy is fraught with limitations. For one, it only provides information about a tiny fraction, it only provides information about a tiny fraction of our ancestry because we get half of our DNA from our mother and the other half from our fathers, our DNA gets shuffled and remixed every generation, hence making it impossible to trace what comes from whom. There are just two bits of DNA that remain pure, the Y chromosome, which is passed down from the father to the son, and something that is called mitochondrial DNA, which is passed down unchanged from the mother to the child. Hank Greeley is also concerned that he quote, uh, I quote, people don't recognize how many ancestors they actually have. He also goes on to state that if a person goes back 20 generations into his or her family, we then have approximately one million, over a million uh, grandparents. So in each generation, DNA testing can only provide information about two of them. 
Hence, the modern science of DNA testing today can only identify less than one, less than 0.1% of your actual DNA. Less than 0.1%. So, these people here have told you through this man's interview, and this was on 60 Minutes, they interviewed the people who propagate this DNA test, and out of their own mouth they tell you, less than 0.1% they can even identify. So without going into the detail, this is just some basic information on how DNA works. We're gonna come around here and briefly touch over the other aboriginals. I'm gonna let you go ahead and touch on this and then I'm gonna close it out with this information here. So we believe that the context, in order to invite the American mind to look at the phenomenon of uh, aboriginals uh, as the first inhabitants of the, uh, of, uh, the Americas, is the whole phenomenon of aboriginals throughout the world. And what we provided for you to invite you to do your research, as Najam has asked us to do, is to look at aboriginals pictorially uh, throughout the world, facts and myths. These are actually documented aboriginals, Aztecs from Mexico. Notice the hair, the distinctive uh, 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 woolly hair uh, of the black. These are aboriginals from uh, China and Japan. Uh, and the Chinese uh, anthropologists have shocked the world, uh, actually, uh, in these late years, and they have documented for a fact uh, that the Chinese originate uh, uh, from Aboriginal peoples. These are Aboriginal Asians uh, uh, in these pictures. These are Aboriginals from Peru. We commonly know about the Aboriginals of Australia. These, to the shock of most who don't know, are the Aboriginals of Ireland. So this whole story about uh, leprechauns is really based on aboriginals who were short statured and small and when they were wiped out and systematically annihilated, the whole identity of them were replaced with the idea of leprechauns uh, with a pot of gold. The pot of gold is their land. Uh, then we look at uh, what is black. Uh, we show Australian, uh, Amamandan, Indian, Malaysia. Uh, Russia, China, uh, that there are many expressions of black. Here we talk about Germany, uh, original aboriginals of Germany. Uh, here we actually have a, a statue uh, in celebration uh, of an aborigine uh, uh, from Germany. In the Solomon Islands, uh, those who uh, may not be aware, uh, this whole idea of blonde hair being unique to uh, Europeans, uh, again, is a false misnomer. Uh, they have documented, they have looked at the DNA genetic structure, and blonde haired uh, uh, aboriginals from the Solomon Islands have no European blood. Uh, the hair is uh, indigenous to them and, and blonde. So that again is a misnomer. Uh, we end here uh, by uh, a culture, uh, India. Okay? And India, as you can see, uh, someone made a joke that this famous Indian here, we'll get a close up on him. There's nothing short of a more handsome Andy Murphy, okay, uh, and here. And then we have the very famous picture of an Aboriginal from Russia. And we know that in England and other European countries, the headdress of the guards of the palaces are actually styled with the original hair of the Aboriginals uh, from Russia, whose hair actually, whose hair actually was uh, a real depiction of that. And then uh, we have a very large influx of Filipinos, uh, Filipinos for the Philippines, and uh, here we see one, two, three, four, five pictures of the aboriginals of the Philippines, commonly called as the Negritos, okay, uh, before the influx of, uh, of other groups of people. So we thought uh, by doing a spin around the globe uh, that if we actually uh, identify uh, and it's worth noting that in many, many cultures of the world, uh, until recent times, the last several hundred years, there was the idea of a one earth theory, uh, the idea of a Pangaea, for example, real or imagined, uh, 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 that people lived uh, on what they believed to be a flat earth surface. Okay, and all over this flat earth surface, you will find the Aboriginal people are everywhere around the globe. Uh, no matter where you go, and in these new times, the systematic extermination and annihilation uh, uh, of these aboriginals. And finally, as uh, Najim has informed us, uh, the systematic annihilation of them right here uh, uh, in the Americas. 
So again, uh, we want to give reference, and, and I'm going to turn it back to Najm. Right. He's going to refer to some of the pioneers uh, and, and some of the names and links that helped us to uh, build and create this uh, exhibit. Okay, so in conclusion here, one term that we have definitely got to make familiar with everyone is something called secret genocide. We don't hear about these people here because they, their genocide was swept under the rug. As I stated before, the American Aboriginals were the most thoroughly swept under the rug, but just like you haven't heard from all the other Aboriginals from around the world, it's the secret genocide. There's some up here we didn't even have time to put up here. You have Samoan Islands, Fiji, Hawaii, you have um, the, the, the Tasmanian people. Okay, these people here, all dark skinned, black, so-called black aboriginals. That's why here we have what is black because black takes many different shades and shapes, just like white, brown, and every other type of people. So we're not restricted to just being African, okay? Now, I told you I was gonna come back to the uh, phrase African-American. Let me go ahead and cite something out of this important book here and I'm gonna give you a uh, reference so you can uh, check me on it, okay? It says here that the uh, United States Presidential Executive Order 13037, signed by Bill Clinton, <coughs> signed by Bill Clinton, uh, the term African American uh, uh, is a federal government term that denotes property, okay? Not a race of people, uh, not a race classification. No, and that gives you no human rights. So Jesse Jackson in 88 was the forerunner to making this term African-American something that all blacks had to label themselves by. If you look at early birth certificates, you went from Negro, then you went from Negro to black, then you went from black to African-American. So once again, the misnomer, they keep changing you and changing you over time because these terms mean something. Just like Negro meant property, Black meant property, African American still means property. So it goes on to say the example of this being true is the Trayvon Martin recent case. There's a thousand Trayvon Martins, but we're using this name to make a point. Whenever you see a black man getting beat in the street or killed by a police officer and you wonder why he can't get prosecuted in court, it's not just because all the cops are in on it, they're all good with the judges, everybody's friends, it's because by law, they did nothing wrong. Your property, your stock, your cattle. So them killing you is equivalent to killing a cow, a man killing a cow on his own ranch. He can't go to jail for that. They're police officers. You're the subordinates. They monitor you. They can't go to jail for killing somebody who's classified as property. So the 14th Amendment that you're under, this African American, is just property, your stock. So this is the problem. This is why you have the NAAIP, okay? This is why you have to identify yourself politically and socially because you will not be respected under any other guise that these people give you. So all these phrases, you say, what does it matter, man? Aboriginal, black, African-American, who cares, man? Who, who really cares? Well, look around. We're the only people who systematically, in today's time, can be spit on, killed, and kicked like a dog and nobody gets persecuted for it. But yet, if you literally kill a police dog, you can do life in jail. Look it up. So, <clears throat> just some small stuff here. Uh, Negro, the only people who has no knowledge of his or her true heritage. Black is not a country or a nationality. It's a color, also known as a, as a crayon, okay? What is your nationality? Because black is not a nationality. African American is not a nationality. So there's a quote online where somebody says, uh, referring to black people, uh, you, you call yourself a color in two continents, okay? Black, African American. None of these things are uh, nationality. None of these things any other race people do. A Chinaman doesn't say, I'm a yellow Chinese American. Africa is not even a country, okay? It is a continent. So you're referring to yourself and identity-wise and as a continent. What country? If you're gonna say you're from Africa or African-American, what's the country? 
You have to get down to the specifics. So you can't just say, I'm African American. They don't say that in Africa. Africans don't call themselves Africans. They say, I'm Iberian, I'm Sudanese, I'm Moroccan, okay, I'm from the Congo. They don't say, I'm African. That's too general of a statement. So uh, I'm going to give a reference now to a lot of the credit of this, these narrations that I read off here, specifically for the uh, real transatlantic slave direction with Paul Cuffey and the, uh, <clears throat> the DNA uh, hoax near, uh, writing here I have on the wall and the $5 Indian history. So um, if you go on YouTube, you'll find some very uh, studious uh, individuals who put together some well, uh, some well um, documented works on the Aboriginals of America. And they start off with uh, the names by Dane Calloway. Check out Dane Calloway's YouTube channel. Very good uh, narrator, very good uh, research specialist. Then you have the indigenous one, uh, one being the numerical one. Uh, then you have uh, Medicine Man. You have a different narrative. You have the original American, uh, autogenous one, all capitals. And the last two are Tavis Sanders and NAAIP Media. And that's where you can get more details on this movement and how you can become a part of it and figure out exactly the ins and outs of what they do. And the book that I have here to reference is once again, this book here. I can't stress how this book is instrumental and very, very valuable to debunking anybody who does not want to uh, credit you when you bring up Aboriginal Americans. And I'll end by saying this. Anybody who's claiming to be educated on black history and they don't tell you about Aboriginals, they're lying. There is no such thing as being well-read and well-learned in black history as some of these people like to do, promote themselves. I'm not gonna say their names, I'm not gonna promote them, but we know who they are, the pro-black, the pan-Africans. We know who they are. If they're not propagating aboriginals from America, they're lying to you. They're paid, they're bought. It's all to misdirect you from your true identity. So you, you ask yourself, well, how come so-and-so doesn't talk about this? How come he talks about Egypt and Kemet and, and, and African and this, this, and this? Trust me, he knows about this. This is not new information. This is not new. So if anybody who's talking about being pro-black and they're not talking about the aboriginals of America, they're not pro-black. If you're pro-black, you're talking about this is your country and, the, and you are the original people here. So I'll close by saying that. Thank you. So we thank you very much, uh, Najim, for uh, uh, walking us through this uh, powerful exhibit. It will be up for approximately uh, one month. Uh, we have close to uh, 5,000 more people that may walk these walls and walk through this uh, exhibit. This is the main education center of the San Diego Fire School District. And again, we dedicate this particularly to the students uh, of our district uh, to give them multiple references and multiple disciplines on how to discover uh, the identity, complex identity journey of so-called uh, Blacks in America. And we thank you very much for your time.